We are going to start off with the last two topics for this semester tonight. We're going to do both of the last two topics tonight. First, we're going to talk about international and comparative law. Now, I want you to remember when I read the scenario that I'm going to put up on this slide that I wrote this 13 years ago, okay? I want you to remember, we're going to read through it, and something may look familiar. This is a hypothetical that I wrote 13 years ago. Enacted with the bipartisan support of the United States Congress in 1994, the North American Free Trade Agreement has not been without its critics. In fact, the landmark free trade agreement between the United States, Canada, and Mexico has met virulent opposition from scores of United States citizens who claim that NAFTA is a bad deal for the United States, with years of job losses and trade deficits to prove it. Assume that in succumbing to the will of the people, the President of the United States decides to walk away from NAFTA. He announces this much to the surprise of the leaders of Canada and Mexico at a hastily convened summit in Cancun. Does this sound vaguely familiar to anybody? I wrote this 13 years ago. Two years ago, President Trump did exactly this. If the United States elects to terminate its involvement in NAFTA, would Canada or Mexico have any recourse against the United States? Would they have any recourse? If so, what remedies would be available to the non-breaching countries? Is international law really relevant, especially if a country can unilaterally terminate its obligations under international law? Well, the first question is, can the president terminate a multilateral legal agreement or treaty? Can the president unilaterally terminate a multilateral Treaty. Any guesses? You say no. Yeah. You say yes. He says yes. You say no. Talk to someone else and they say, I don't know. <laughs> okay. I don't have any idea what I'm saying. That was an old song. That was a Beatles song. Can the president say, we're done with this? Why do you think, Abdulma? Um, because the um, UK, um, UK left the, um, the European Union. Uh -huh. So it's, it's more like a treaty also. Uh -huh. So that shows you can leave a treaty if you want to. Uh, the country in, 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 in West Africa mm -hmm. that left the treaty of West African countries that you could go freely from a West African country. But since when they left the treaty, you have to have a visa to go to them. So it's okay, so if it's a treaty, then it's not the same thing as a law that we have inside the United States. Is that what you're saying? Not really, is it? No, well, I know you can pull away from it. You can pull away from it. Okay. The President of the United States can actually pull us out of treaties. The President of the United States, who made the treaty, is the chief international officer when treaties are made. The Senate, which gives advice and consent to the treaty, is just that, gives advice and consent. A bill goes through Congress, it passes through the House and the Senate, it becomes law in the United States. But outside the United States, it's the president and his actions who rules 
what that treaty does, okay? Kind of interesting, isn't it? So, do they have any recourse against the United States? What do you think? Can they try and sue the United States in federal court? No. Why not? To make a choice not to form allies or treat with other countries. Yeah. They're not citizens of the United States. Really. No. Could they take it to the international court? They could, but what happens with the international court? What good is it going to do? None, really. The international court comes down with a ruling. Does the United States have to pay any attention to it? Not necessarily, okay? So treaties are very delicate things. International law in and of itself governs the conduct of states and international organizations and their relations with one another and natural and juridical persons. So international law is what we base our relationships between other countries and ourselves. International organizations include the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization, most of which the United States are participating members. Natural and juridical persons are individuals like us and businesses. Now, is there any other way for a business to do business internationally without a treaty? Yeah. You're saying you change your mind. You said you're saying yes now. You have a business without a treaty. You can't do business without a treaty. Yeah. That's right. How do you do business without a treaty? Well, one way is to set up an international business. And you have business in the United States owning business overseas. You can do business with other companies and other individuals overseas by contract. Those contracts are enforceable in the world court or in the courts of either nation that the contract specifies as being the nation which will have judicial oversight for the contract, okay? Methods of international business involvement. Exporting, we have exports, including the use of foreign sales representatives and distributors. So treaties are fine. We have treaties, and we'll talk about some. We have one called Most Favored Nation Status. That's a treaty. And the United States signs those treaties with other countries overseas. That means there might not be tariffs or duties on goods that go back and forth. So taxes are reduced. That means prices are reduced. That means people can buy more of each other's goods. But can they do that under contract, too? without the most favored nation status. Can I get a discount for buying parts for my bicycles from other countries, say from Italy, under contract, or France, or Germany? I buy the, the gears from Germany, the wheels from, from Italy, and the frames from France. If I can get favorable terms under an individual contract, won't that work? Yeah. So there are many ways without having treaties for things to function. Unfortunately, NAFTA, people were afraid it wasn't going to work, but it did. Did we have all those deficits and, and lose jobs in the United States? Not really. Because when the jobs went to the other countries, that we were trying to buy parts from them for, say, cars, that meant 
we were able to create other things in their place. And that's what happened. And people did not, over, over the long haul, lose jobs. Okay? So franchise agreements. Can we franchise internationally? Yes. Sure, you bet. Think about Hardee's hamburger. Who is their international partner in Canada? Carl Jr. Carl Jr. Excellent. Carl Jr. And how do they do that? Carl Jr. actually owns all those stores and they franchise back to the United States. And it's an, it's an international agreement. I saw it in California too. I've never seen a Hardee's before. I Right, that's that they just operate. There's something about the name. That's the same thing with rallies and checkers. Mm -hmm. Rallies and checkers are identical, identically the same. It's just they're called different things in different places. And international law and international contracts allow us to do this, not necessarily with a treaty. Joint ventures. Anybody know of a joint venture that we've had in the United States recently? Automobiles. How about Chrysler and Daimler Benz? Mercedes Benz went together with Chrysler and they had automobiles. The engines and some of the parts were engineered in Germany and were put together in the United States. Now, Chrysler and Fiat. Fiat actually owns most of Chrysler. Oh, I know one that's one. Okay, go ahead. T-Mobile and Sprint. T-Mobile and Sprint is a joint venture. No, they're trying to do it. They're trying to become one? Yeah, they're trying to become like acquisition. Oh, well, that's an acquisition or a takeover. I thought they denied it. Or a is merger. It, is it T-Mobile with uh, Metro PCS now? Yeah. Yes. Oh, 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 oh. They, they own, yeah, they, they are with them now because they always have them. Oh. Yes, Sheree? Uh, what about ATT and DirecTV? Uh, that would be a merger, acquisition, or a takeover. They're not international companies. Mm -hmm. Oh, so that's the same company that's here and that's there. Okay. We're talking about international right now. Foreign subsidiaries and affiliates. Those of you who eventually take my international financial management course will find out that there are a lot of companies overseas that are parts of large companies here in the United States. They are subsidiaries of companies in the United States. Or companies in the United States can be affiliates of or wholly owned subsidiaries of companies overseas, right? Shell. Do you know Shell? Shell. Yeah. Shell is a big one. Who owns Shell? Where is Shell's home? Here. No. Uh, no. It's the Netherlands. Oh. Mm -hmm. what Shell Oil Company was originally a North Sea oil company that did all its drilling offshore in the North Sea. They expanded here to the United States and started buying up oil lands over here. So they did that under an international contract. What about like, um, Texaco? Texaco is the United States. Texaco, we have Texaco also. Okay, yeah, and it's owned, it's multinational corporation headquartered here in the United States. Texaco, Texas company. So it was founded in Texas. Ethical considerations in international business. Do we do the first one? Business with repressive governments. Do we do business with repressive governments? That can be a very big issue. Go ahead. In general, it's a go queue. So now they're trying to stop the arms deals and go against US having arms in Saudi Arabia. Yes. Because of the killing of Al Qasidi. Yes. Yes, it is. Very involved. Ethics with, quote, repressive governments is, is very involved and very difficult to determine what 
is right and what is wrong. There is something to consider when we talk about ethics with companies. Early in the semester, we talked about how ethics are profitable, ethical, and legal, right? But there's another characteristic of ethics that is very important. The ethics for companies are derived from the philosophies of its board of directors. So, if we say we don't like the ethics of this company, essentially we're saying that we don't like the board of directors of that company because they set the ethics tone. Those of you that are interested in pursuing this kind of information and knowledge and discussion, my business ethics course that's being given in the spring is a good one to take. Do we provide products for the poor at reasonable prices? Well, the question is, what is a reasonable price? Do, do we subsidize products? The United States is famous for subsidizing agricultural products. But does that help the poor? You think? What happens with subsidized agricultural products? products or lands. Um, is that when the government pays like local farmers to grow their crops and then buy it directly from them or something like that? They either buy it directly from them and store it and keeps it until it, they can sell it for a better price or they pay them not to plant the land. So let's say the government finds out that we're producing a surplus of corn this year. They will pay the farmer not to plant corn on that same land next year. And the farmer just makes application and says, I'm not going to plant X number of acres of corn. The government pays them for the subsidy and then the farmer goes out and plants something else, like soybeans. Anybody know anything about agriculture? A little bit, Zach? Corn takes a lot of what out of the soil? Nutrients. It takes a lot of nutrients out of the soil. What happens if you take corn out of and rotate it with beans or uh, like green beans or lima beans or any kind of beans and you put that in? Or soybeans or something like that. What happens? What happens to the soil? So they put, they put the nutrients back. Put the nutrients back in, so next year you can plant corn again. So you can be subsidized, renew your soil, and sell that product all at the same time, can't you? So there is there there is something about when we say subsidize and provide products for the poor at reasonable prices, which makes me stop and think about how we're creating our manufacturing, agricultural, and commercial products. Now, whether to treat workers according to local customs or consistent with international standards of humane treatment. Who in here is wearing an article of clothing that was made outside the United States? Everybody should have their hand up. Everybody should have their hand up. We all wear clothing that was made somewhere else. My shoes were made in Indonesia. They were made under a contract with firms in Germany and the United States. An international, an international contract that they're being produced overseas. Now, is that a benefit to creating products for the poor at reasonable prices? If we're an international marketplace, if we are an international company, is that a good idea? If these shoes I'm wearing would cost $300 if they were made in the United States, but I have production 
partially created in other countries around the world and then shipped to the United States and they only cost $25 and I can wear them for work and lots of people can wear them for work. Am I creating a standard of living where people can get jobs where they have to look really good at lower prices than if they were all made in the United States? Yes, and sometimes no. Yes, and sometimes no. Because sometimes they're not always made available to everyone who needs them, right? So the ethics that we work with in international business is sometimes very unique, very unique, okay? So treating workers according to local customs. What happens when we hear that um, somebody is creating a product that sells for $300 in the United States and they're paying their workers 40 cents an hour. Have you ever heard of something happening like that? The iPhone, what, what about the iPhone? It's Chinese, right? Yeah, the China company that composite doesn't get paid more time I think it um, wasn't the country in Africa where they get the, the material. Mm -hmm. They do this like child labor and stuff. Mm -hmm. And for chocolate also, mm -hmm. they have some countries where it's like child labor for them to get all this, um, the cocoa for chocolate. And this is kind of the same thing. Yeah, now is that consistent with international standards of humane treatment? Do we have a right as a nation when we import a product to say we want to see the conditions under which these are made? Or do we just go to the store, buy the shirt, buy the shoes, buy the trousers, and walk out? Do we ever think about that? Okay, well, see, that's something maybe sometimes we ought to. There were some companies that were forced to shut down because, or not sell out a certain line of clothing a, a few years ago because there were considerations of ethical and humane treatment for their workers. The General Agreement on Tariff and Trade, or GATT. GATT is a comprehensive multilateral trading system designed to achieve distortion-free, that is a major buzzword, international trade through minimization of tariffs and removal of artificial trade barriers. We all know what a tariff is, right? It's tax. But what's an artificial trade barrier? Can anyone give me an example of an artificial trade barrier? I will give you one. The Japanese government has set up a trade barrier which says you may not, Mr. Businessman in Japan, import American beef or certain types of American vegetables. Why do they have that trade barrier? It's artificial. It was created by the government. People want those, those things that the U.S. can export to. Why is it an artificial trade barrier? Maybe that's something like that. Not health issues. Stop them like the way they stop GMO, GMOs from coming into the country. That's what they say. They don't want GMOs because they don't think they're healthy. And the jury is still out on that, isn't it? We don't know what effect genetically modified, for those of you that aren't up on your GMO, genetically modified or organic products such as modified corn, modified beans, modified beef that it's modified because they eat the corn that has been modified. So you wonder, is this an artificial trade barrier? Well, if we look into it a little bit farther, we find out that the farmers 
in Japan are in direct competition with products coming from the United States, which will cost less than the farmers in Japan can produce them for. So the government is protecting them with a trade barrier to keep American products, which would make either their population healthier or able to take care of their uh, food and clothing needs a little easier. It's kept it out so that their Japanese farmers can produce and sell it in their own home markets. Now, the thing comes down to, is there anything really wrong with that? Mm -hmm. Don't we want our own people at home to do well first? Mm -hmm. But what if doing well at home first means that we supply them with high quality products at lower prices so that everyone does eats well and is clothed well and has even building products. They even exclude wood products. What about that? Is, is that ethical? Does that stand up? Does that stand up under GATT? Well, they've been trying for years to remove those trade barriers and they haven't been able to. There are a lot of countries that have trade barriers. And if we minimize them and we remove them, there, can, there are always arguments made on both sides. Now, the United States has renegotiated NAFTA, which the example that we talked about very early on the second slide. The United States is renegotiating its Mexico and Canadian deals and setting up new parameters for that treaty. And GATT, we are still members of GATT. I don't think anybody really knows what it is. Except you now. Right? What are the principles of trade law that GATT sets up? Article 1, the principle of most favored nation <coughs> status. That is, normal trade relations. I send to you, you send to me. We won't have a lot of taxes on these things coming back and forth to artificially raise the prices so that everybody has a good advantage when they buy something. World Trade Organization members have to treat similar goods coming from other WTO members on an equal basis. So no discrimination against like products on the basis of their country of origin. So if we have oranges and we sell oranges, various kind of countries and their markets. And South America sells oranges also to those countries. It says that we just put them on the shelf together and we treat them on an equal basis. Now, what this doesn't mean prohibits discrimination against like products on the basis of their country of origin. What that doesn't mean is that they can't put it on the shelf with a little sign that says California oranges, Indonesian oranges, Brazilian oranges. Sure, they can do that. Do people think they taste differently? Maybe. Some people like me say, well, an orange is an orange. And they'll get the ones that are less expensive, right? And then we stick clothes into them and hang them up in our closets and make all of our clothes smell nice. Anybody ever do that when you were little? For your mom for Christmas? Stick clothes in an orange and hang it up? Well, I just gave you an idea for a cheap Christmas present. Article 3 establishes principles of national treatment that prohibits World Trade Organization members from regulating, taxing, or treating imported products any differently than domestically produced products. This is where the Japanese and the United States have conflict because they treat their beef differently than they treat our beef. And they don't export a lot of their beef. Anybody ever heard of Kobe beef? Okay, now that is reportedly and reputedly the best beef in the world, right? 
because it's raised different. But is it taxed or otherwise treated as an imported product differently from domestic produced products here in the United States? It's just as expensive. So we don't treat it any differently, but they treat our beef differently. Article 6 prohibits certain types of dumping and subsidies. What's dumping? What's dumping? Anybody know? Essentially, um, exporting waste products like yeah. that, that will feed your own people, yeah. kind of like giving them the bottom of the barrel. Well, not really, but that could be part of a, part of a scenario. Uh, dumping is when one country will produce goods and sell it at cheap prices in a country which will take things and build things with it. So let's say, and here this happened years, many years ago. The, you know how Pittsburgh was famed for its steel operations. They used a furnace called a Bessemer steel furnace. That Bessemer steel furnace was a very slow process. It would melt the iron, you'd have to add the charcoal, you'd have to expose it to oxygen while it was being churned and poured back and forth between containers. And then it would be poured into, into uh, ingots and then taken to another factory where it would be heated and rolled into sheets. Well, that's what the United States used to do. And it was very expensive to do that compared to the Japanese furnace where they decided that they were going to use a special kind of furnace where you put all the ingredients into one vat and then blow oxygen up through the bottom of it and it can make steel four times faster. Because they could make it four times faster, they could make four times more of it than we could, which meant they could sell it in the US market for four times less than what we were charging for our produced steel that was domestic. That is dumping. When you sell goods at cheap or subsidized prices, Japanese also subsidized their steel, so they were actually paying the manufacturers to do this. And sell it in another country like the United States, where the product would be more expensive. Okay? Article 11 prohibits quantitative restrictions on imports. In other words, we can't tell somebody how much of something they can import. The laws of supply and demand are what actually regulates the amount of imports. Regional trade agreements, the free trade agreement, two or more states agree to reduce and gradually eliminate tariffs and other trade barriers. NAFTA is a free trade agreement. NAFTA is where we have attempts to reduce tariffs and prices and other trade barriers from goods coming in from Mexico and from Canada, from goods going from the United States to Canada and to Mexico. Bilateral trade agreement. This is where two states agree on issues related to trade between them. This is like what, well, Brexit, where the United Kingdom, England, is trying to negotiate a special trade agreement with the European Union. They, it's a two-state thing. The European Union negotiates as a unit. So all of their countries negotiate together with Britain on two separate sides of the table. You've got the European Union on one side, you've got Britain on the other. And they try and negotiate prices and trade and tariffs and all sorts of things like that. Examples are the United States bilateral agreements with Australia, Israel, Jordan, and Singapore. And now that we're kind of trying to wait and see what happens, 
with Brexit and with the European Union, we also have bilateral trade agreements with Europe, and we're going to have it with England. So that's going to be a very complicated thing to watch. It provides a better understanding of the general purpose of law when we study legal systems of other states. It assists in development of critical viewpoint of one's own legal system. It demonstrates that one's own legal system is only one of many alternatives and could lead to the adoption of another state's law or method of resolving a dispute. Now this is comparative law that we're talking about at this point. Let me ask you, do you know of another country that uses a different form of law than the United States? China. What form of law do they use? That's part of their legislation, yes, the, the number of children they have. But what's their major form of law? Ours is, we base our law on the common law. Does anybody know of another state that has a different basis or original code for their law? Islamic law, that's a very good example. Islamic law is another form of comparative law. When we go into countries that use Islamic law, we have to adapt to their form of law. What other ones are there out there? The UK is very similar to law in the United States. It's just slightly tweaked because it's the UK. But it's common law as well. That's where we got ours. Go across the English Channel. Italy. It's different. What kind of what, what kind of law do they have? Okay. Russia's different. Russia's very different. <laughs> we'll talk about Russia in a second. Italy, France, Spain, Japan, China, all use a form that they've adapted of the Napoleonic Code. Essentially, the Napoleonic Code was set up to make the state the supreme owner of everything. And I'll give you an example here in a minute. In the United States, individuals own the property. In Napoleonic Code countries, the government owns the property. And they tell you what you can do with it. And then you can own it free of any liens to a certain extent. For example, this is something you don't a lot of people don't think about it, but I do because my wife's a nurse. When somebody needs a transplant and another person has passed away, in the United States, the family has to sign consent forms for the organs to be taken so that it can be transplanted, right? Transplant, the lungs and the heart, the corneas of the eye are very important. Sometimes bones. Um, sometimes the bone marrow, because someone has leukemia or a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, just, there are all kinds of body parts that are interchangeable based upon the needs of the individual. In the United States, we have to sign consents so that that can happen. But if you go to France and you are a citizen of France and you're operating under French law, this is also true in Haiti, Dominican Republic, when you die, the government owns all transplantable body parts and if they are viable and able to be transplanted into someone who needs them, they can do that without anybody's consent. The government can just send down an order and say, make the transplant. The 
from this person. That's where it's different. All of these things are the government's responsibility. Right? So, we were, Larry brought up Russian law. What's Russian law like, Larry? Putin. Whatever he wants to put. Whatever he wants, he gets. Okay. Uh, do you know what the basis of their law is? They seem like, uh, I don't know the exact word to use, but I've talked to a few people last night and like, uh, is it con not con communist? 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 Oh, am I right? Yeah. Um, that's what they were until 1983. Now we call it socialist. Now we call it socialism. No. Communism is godless socialism. You can have socialism that recognizes religion and allows religion to flourish. You can have countries with socialism that cuts God off and takes every, try and takes everybody away from God. That is communism. All the property is still distributed to each person according to their need. That's where the commune in communism came from. But it was also had that godless factor. The um, socialists in France, France is kind of a socialist government. It's a democratic socialist government. Italy is a democratic socialist government under the Napoleonic style of code. They uh, have, they vote. They have a, a, very much like a Congress, a parliament. They have, in Japan, they have the dial. In China, they have the people's democratic uh, legislative body. So it's the major, major international bodies of law that we study are common law, the Napoleonic Code, the Islamic Code, the socialist political codes of various countries. And there's a really, really a weird one that they call Nulla. Anybody guess where that comes from? Nulla. What does it sound like I'm speaking? It's Swedish. Sweden has their own form of law that you have to study for years to figure it out. But it's very interesting. I just can't follow it. I'm sorry. Okay, let's move on. Legal systems and procedures, we have civil law, we have common law, and socialist law, and Islamic law, for the most part. Civil law, this is the Napoleonic Code. It consists of detailed national legal codes, and they're the sole official source of law. That's the primary world system. Common law is based on constitutions, legislation, and regulations, and interpretations by courts. That is what we have in the United States, what we have in Canada, what we have in Great Britain, Ireland, Scotland, Wales. Socialist law systems, which is what Larry was talking about, we were talking about as the socialist form of laws, is where rights of society outweigh individual rights and the state owns both the means of production and the property. Now when you get into managerial economics, you will find that socialist law systems tend to have a disincentive for individual production and entrepreneurship. No, Cuba, Cuba is not. Cuba is as well. They are a socialist law system. They used to be communist. They are now converted to a socialist law system, and they have a, dem a democratic uh, legislative body. Islamic law 
is derived from the Sharia and the Quran. So we have those major legal systems and we study those and compare them in order to do what? To adapt our contracts, to write our contracts into law so we can do business in those countries and so we can set up international treaties with various parts of the world that will be a source of uh, trade for and will be beneficial for each side. Dispute settlement methods, well we have litigation. The court has to have jurisdiction just like we talked about early in the semester and subject matter jurisdiction over the issues involved in the dispute. So litigation would go to say the world court. Arbitration on the other hand we study and arbitration is where the parties sit down together and negotiate a settlement so that hopefully everybody comes out with a advantage. So that's the end of the international law section. Read it in the book and you'll get more of an idea of what we're going to do. I'm going to give you a 20 minute break to 10 minutes after the hour and come back and we're going to study cyber law.